Nope, I did that wrong. Okay, well, we'll just leave it as it is. Okay, so I'm just gonna get started on this and I apologize ahead of time. Um, I am not really good at giving presentations. So if I get tongue tied or I screw up, I apologize ahead of time, okay? Um, in my previous life, um, I was a new home sales um, uh, person for some of the top builders in the city. I actually did it for 35 years and sold a crap ton of houses. Um, so now that I've transitioned over to being a regular realtor, um, they thought it would be a good idea to just kind of help um, the people in this office get a better understanding of the new construction process. Um, with the lack of inventory homes on the market, more and more realtors are looking for alternatives and selling new construction is a good alternative. Um, so let's just kind of get started. Um, I have a slideshow here that'll kind of you know, walk me through this uh, just to help me more than anything. First and foremost, one of the best things that you can do is to have a clear conversation with your home buyer as to how the process works um, from the very get-go. Um, the last thing that you want to have happen as a realtor is to have your buyer wander into a sales model without you and they start working with the rep and then next thing you know, two or three appointments later, you're like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm working with this person. And at that point, it's too late or they've written a contract and you're, you know, you can't be added to the deal. So what I recommend doing is to, to really make it make your home buyer aware, do not go to a sales model without me. Um, and if you happen to go to a sales model, give them a stack of your cards and say, the first thing that you need to do is basically give the card to the sales rep and say, I am working with so-and-so realtor, they sent me to see you. Um, part of the registration process, now every builder is a little bit different. Some builders do require you to have, to actually threshold the buyer in. Other you know, building companies are a little bit more lenient. You can make a phone call to the sales rep and say, hey, I'm sending so-and-so in. And other times they basically, you know, if, if the, the customer gives the card to the sales rep they, and say, hey, I'm working with so-and-so realtor, that is good enough. But again, every um, builder is a little bit different on their policy, their threshold policy. Okay, so, all right. The other thing that you need to understand is as a realtor, every builder's commissions are different. Some um, building companies basically um, have a flat fee that they pay realtors, other um, like maybe $2,500. Other ones um, pay a 3% commission on the base price of the house. Other times it could be on the final price of the house. And then on some homes that are difficult to sell, they might even give you a 4% co-op commission. And of course this is paid at closing. So one of the things that I would recommend doing as a realtor is to build a relationship with a builder rep for each company. Um, I myself, I have a rep that I use for every single builder in town. I have, I know them personally. I um, have a great relationship with them so that I can literally just pick up the phone and say, you know, I have a buyer that's looking at this price range in this area and looking for this monthly payment. What have you got? Um, and if you don't have that, I strongly recommend that you do that. Um, some builders do not cross sell. What I mean by that is the sales rep can only sell that particular community. In that case, you, you have to work with that particular sales rep in that community if that's where your, your home buyer is, is interested in. Okay, so when you schedule an appointment for your buyer and you walk into a sales model, this basically is what it's gonna look like. It is a really beautifully decorated model and generally the office is um, the sales office for the sales rep. Um, and one of the things I'd like to recommend doing is let the sales rep run the show. Um, you know, you're there to guide your buyer, but the sales rep really needs to do the majority of the talking. And I would recommend, you know, intervene only every once in a while. Um, they are gonna go through a whole series of things and they're basically gonna qualify your buyer. Um, and when they walk through the model, um, they're gonna see all kinds of upgrades in the model. Um, a great example of this is the models are professionally decorated. They have every option under the sun in them. Um, and, and they're made so that, this, that the home buyer wants to upgrade, wants to spend more money. 
um, that's where the builder makes their money. Um, and there's also additional options that are in this house that aren't even for sale. For example, um, where I have the arrows, those aren't options that the builder even offers, but they give the buyer ideas on how they could personalize this house later after they've moved in. The other thing is, is on the exterior of the house, um, there's additional options like uh, upgraded landscaping. A lot of the builders will have a standard landscaping package, but you know the upgraded landscaping that they're seeing um, isn't even available. Same way with the exterior lighting that you're seeing here, that's not even available, but it's what you technically can do to the homes. The builder wants to sell the sizzle, basically is what I'm saying. So go back, Katie. I, can you? Yeah, I just have to. <laughs> okay. So um, when you go into the model and you deal with the sales rep, um, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to qualify the buyer and basically ask for wants and needs, like, you know, what size home, what style of home, what price range, what payment range, um, how soon do you need to be in something? Um, do you have time to build or you, do you not have time to build? Um, you know, what is your wish list? What are your absolute musts? Um, do you have a particular absolute must as to what type of home site that you're interested in? And then they narrow it down to two or three different floor plans and two or, or a particular neighborhood or um, a particular home sites even. And then you sit down with the, with the sales rep and they do pricing based on the, the, the particular floor plan that the buyer is actually interested in. And it's not uncommon to have um, from the base price to the options that are added $50,000 in, in additional upgrades. Um, that's not uncommon at all. The thing that you have to advise your buyer of is when they walk into the model, they're seeing everything under the sun. So my first suggestion as a realtor is to advise them, you know, write down your absolute musts your must haves and write down your wish list. And it's basically gonna be a compromise. It's gonna be an, a balancing act. They're not gonna get every single option that they want in this house. Just like with existing homes, they're not gonna get everything that they want. It is gonna be a compromise. Otherwise they're gonna price themselves out so bad that it's gonna be unaffordable lots of times. Next slide. Yep, next slide. Okay, so um, this is a good example of um, a, a plat map or a layout of a neighborhood. I just use this as an example, um, but the once you've picked out the house that you like, you typically will then look at the home sites that are available. And the builders will not allow the same house side by side or the same elevation side by side. So you have to almost kind of, you know, if it's a very popular home, which typically the model homes are are one of the most popular ones. So you have to kind of, you know, decide which which home sites make the most sense. Um, and you can see over to the right that there could be some hefty, hefty premiums available or included that are an additional option, just like an option of adding a fireplace, the home site would be an option as well. The base price home site is typically in the price, but you know, if it's a more desirable home site, it would be extra. Some builders, every single home site is a premium. That is not uncommon with certain builders. Other builders have very minor premiums and that varies as well. Um, the, the picture over to the left kind of shows what the section of that development technically is um, for, for like what's available right now um, compared to what that entire section is gonna be. And then the next slide is gonna be an overview for the entire neighborhood. This kind of comes into play when you have a buyer that says, I'm only gonna be in this house for maybe two or three years. Then you may want to you know, advise them, this may not be the best community for you because you might be competing with the builder later on. You know, Three years down the road, they might still be building in that neighborhood. And you know, why buy an existing home when they can turn right around and, and instead of getting into a bidding war, war with people, they just go over to the builder and the builder can build the house for the people with their, you know, their wants and their needs and their colors that they want, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, depending on the time frame for the buyer's needs, um, there are lots of times spec homes that are available. A spec home is an inventory home. It's a house that's under construction. It could be in the phase that it hasn't even dug yet, or it could be near completion or everything in between. So what a spec basically means is it's already you know, started. Um, it's a quicker move in house. Um, typically the colors are already selected. All the options are selected. 
Now, some builders will allow the home buyer to make changes to the house, like make their own color selections to the house um, in the foundation stage. But rule of thumb is for the most part, everything's pre-selected and um, the benefit of it, it's gonna give you a, a quicker move in. So, Katie? Okay. <laughs> So uh, once you've narrowed down the pricing and the options and the payment um, with the sales rep, one of the things that I would recommend is to advise your buyer as to really what are the best options that they should select for resale. And, and then the other thing would be is, you know, if, if they're looking at a $30,000 lot premium, premium, are they going to get that back when it comes time to sell the house? I think that you have to give your advice to them because um, you're representing them in the transaction as to why or why not. Um, you know, I mean, are they better off taking a vanilla interior lot and adding trees to the back of it instead of paying $30,000 for a wooded home site or a tree lined home site lots of times, if that makes sense. Okay, so every builder typically, and I'm, I'm mainly talking about production builders here, but these builders typically have their own financing incentives. And what I mean by that is they give, if you use their lender, um, lots of times any promotions that they have affiliated with it are tied to having to use their lender. Um, but there are definite benefits to using that particular lender because they give you anywhere from two to $5,000 towards prepaids, closing costs, or instead of using it towards that, they can buy down the interest rate and buy out of PMI. Um, and the builder wants to do that so they can have, you know, they can control of the closing, they, they have a better opportunity to use their um, appraisers. Um, they can control the sale a little bit better and they don't have delays in closings because of a lender that's not used to the, the new build process. The other thing is, is um, the credit repair programs that are available, since the building process typically takes anywhere from six to eight months now because of COVID, because everybody's so slammed, it, it can take up to like you know, 13 or 14 months, lots of times from the time that they, the buyer purchases the house to the time that they move in. But knowing that the, um, the builders lenders offer credit repair programs. So if you have a buyer that really needs credit repair, there are some builders out there that do a, a, an excellent job actually of credit repair programs. If they have like a 620 credit score and they really needed to get up to a 680 credit score, um, some of these lenders are, are so good at it that they put them on programs and by the time the house is done, they are definitely at a 680 credit score. And if they're not, um, and they put them on these programs, they don't have to buy the house lots of times. The builder is taking the risk. So, okay. So after the home buyer has picked the house, picked the options, and they are pretty comfortable with the home site, the next step is to really do a home site deposit um, or to do just, you skip the home site deposit and go directly to contract. Now, um, lots of times, if you can get away with it, I would recommend doing a home site deposit, then request to get all of the contractual paperwork to review. And the reason I say that is because lots of times the builders are now using DocuSign or dot loop and the, the, the home buyers are just clicking and signing, clicking and signing and clicking and signing. And, and, and they don't really read the paperwork. They don't read the contract uh, because it goes so fast. So um, if the builder does allow a lot deposit, it is helpful to do that just to give them, a, you know, time to really look over all of the paperwork to, to get a better understanding of what they're getting into. So um, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you is builders contracts, the builder actually writes the contract. The realtor does not. Um, it's all on the builder's paperwork and the, and the contractor, are, they're generally skewed towards the builder. Um, and, and this is as a realtor, it's important to explain to the buyer, hey, you know, here's why you need builder rep. This is why you need representation. Um, the builder, the builder's rep, the lender, and the construction supervisor, they're there to represent the builder. They're not there to represent you. So as a home buyer, it is important that you have representation. So if something happens and goes amiss, who are they going to be able to rely on? And that's where you come in as a third party to assist them. The other thing is, is a lot of the builders contracts are now, now saying that um, the buyers do not have mineral rights to their property. 
Um, that's not uncommon anymore. And then the other thing is you have to realize that if the house does not appraise, so if it's an FHA loan or if it's a VA loan, by law, if it doesn't appraise, the buyer can cancel the contract to get their money back. But on a conventional loan, that's not the case. So if the home buyer purchases the house and adds upgrades and it does not appraise for any reason, they are still responsible for closing on that house. And if they can't close on that house, the builder will cancel the contract and keep their entire deposit. So let's talk about deposits a second. Um, when you have um, a VA loan with the builders, they are still required to give a deposit. And these deposits vary per builder. Um, generally, they're anywhere from two to 5%. And it's usually right at contract. Um, I mean, you're gonna you know, cough up that money pretty quick and, and that'll carry them through until closing. But it, sometimes it becomes an issue when you're dealing with a VA buyer and they're going a zero down payment. So if they're, if they're a VA buyer and they're going zero down, they still expect the deposit and then that, that deposit will be refunded to them at closing. Okay, so what happens after the contract is written? Um, most builders will give a home buyer a clear, you know, like a page of, of items that, a to-do list basically. And the first thing that they typically do is they go in for financing. Um, they, they make an online application and then they schedule a time to make sure that all of the structural options are picked and then they go to the design center. Um, and, and so that's pretty typical. So, and then this kind of gives you an overview of what happens when kind of from, from, you know, once the contract is written, what happens after that. So this is this, the, the one on the left is basically explaining that the one on the right talks about how they communicate with the home buyer if they use that particular lender during the process. So this is a good example of what the design center looks like or what color boards look like. Now, some builders um, are now moving to color boards, which is the whole bottom section. And they have basically five choices, like kind of almost like a good, better, best concept. And they no longer go to the design center. Their color boards are like right at the model and you pick them out with the sales rep. On other, on, on other times, some builders still offer a design center um, and you would go within the next couple of weeks after writing the contract and signing the contract with the, the sales rep, going and picking your colors. And usually it's probably a three or four hour meeting, I'd say. And then once you've picked your colors, you're done. No changes. I don't care if you beg, borrow, plead, whatever. They will not allow any changes. And the reason for that is because the permit process has then started. So um, the permit process can take anywhere from three weeks to eight weeks, depending on the municipality. Um, and, and it's a very detailed process. There's uh, three sets of plans, specifications, um, you know, roof trusts, um, roof trusts um, like pages that have to be ordered through the trust company, floor joists that have to be ordered through the, the, the floor joist company that all gets packaged together. And then they have a processor that sends them to, to the municipality for the actual permitting process. Um, and then it's up to the municipality on how quickly they get them back. Sometimes they're so bogged down that it could take, you know, six weeks or more for the municipality to send them back to the builder. So there's actually a lull period in there where nothing's happening on the outside, but there's a lot of stuff happening on the inside. Um, so once the permits have come back, shortly after that, or they know that they're coming back, the construction supervisor will receive what they call the start package. And then from there, um, they schedule a meeting to meet with the customer. Um, sometimes it's virtual because of COVID and other times they actually meet at the model. And it's a, it's a pretty elaborate two hour meeting. And the, the thing that they do is they go over the blueprints that are drawn up for that particular house with the options that that home buyer um, has purchased in with the house. Um, they talk about um, the roles and the responsibilities. They talk about communication during the process. Now, every builder is also a little bit different with that. Some actually have portals. Some of them, they, you know, supervisors say, here's my, you know, cell phone number. Here's my email address. Communicate with me however you want. Others basically say, hey, we don't want you in the house. 
if you want to go into the house, you need to talk to your sales rep and your sales rep will, you know, take you over to the house from time to time, but we really don't want you in the home while it's under construction. It is a construction site and it's for your safety purposes. And again, every builder is a little bit different on how they handle that. Um, and then, and the communication as well. So this kind of gives you an understanding of a plot plan. One of the things that, that they review other than the blueprints is a plot plan. And the plot plan is basically how the house sits on the home site and um, the side yard requirements, the easements that are on the home site, um, the grade of the property, um, how high it sits above sea level. So like if you're looking at it, you see the little arrows, that's the way that the water is going to drain. If you look at the back of the property, it's showing you <clears throat> there's an easement um, on the rear of the property, which is typically like the utility easement um, of where the, you know, like the telephone, the cable and so forth is, is running. Um, and it's also showing on this particular one, a garage right. It is possible that the houses can be flip-flopped and be a mirror image of each other and it would be a garage left. And that's totally left up to the builder on how that's gonna be. So shortly after the pre-construction meeting, construction starts. So this is gonna be just a brief overview of the whole construction process from beginning to end. So the first thing they do is they excavate. The picture on the right is showing you what a basement looks like excavated. Then the next thing is the footers. The footers go in afterwards and then there's a footer inspection that is typically done on the properties. After that, the foundation goes in and builders do different foundations. Some use a block foundation, some use a port foundation. And honestly, there's, there's pros and cons to both foundations. Um, this is kind of just like a, a cutout showing you what, you know, how a foundation sits on the footers and what all goes into it for that. And then once the foundation is in, then the builder will come in with a dozer and backfill it up. So they'll bring the dirt up against the foundation and then it sits for a few days um, and they do another inspection before they start the framing process. So then the lumber package gets delivered and the framing begins. Um, they typically, uh, the framing takes a good couple of weeks. Sometimes it takes five days. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks, depending on if there is a full crew. Then once the house is framed and under roof, they will put the, um, the roof on and they will install the windows. Then from there, they also will in install the house wrap. And then different builders, again, use different house wraps. Some use Tyvek, some use Thurply, some use GreenGuard, but you know, it, it really depends on the different builder. Um, they're all pretty good products. And, it, and the reason that they put the house wrap on there is to protect the house from the elements in the winter, from the snow, and in the, in, the, in the other seasons, the rain, um, so that the floors don't get you know, all beat up. Um, and it really is a good protection. So after that, then they start working on the inside of the house. Um, they do the rough HVAC. They next would do the rough plumbing process, and then they would do the rough electrical process. And then with each one of these processes um, that they do, there's inspections that are affiliated with them. So there could be lag times in the building process. You know, you could see the rough electric go in, and then nothing happens for a week, and the home buyer is saying, "Hey, nothing's going on with my house." Well, the reason being is they might be waiting for an inspector um, or the inspection got turned down because the inspector saw something that they didn't like and they have to re-inspect it. On the outside of the house, they're starting to put the exterior trim on, they're starting to put and they're installing the, you know, the siding, whether it be vinyl siding or hardy plank siding um, to protect the house completely. So while they're working on the outside, they're also working on the inside. And then they will do the, and then they'll insulate the house. Um, and then from there, then they'll do the drywall process. The drywall process can take a couple of weeks, actually. Um, this is a picture showing you the house has been drywalled and then they've sanded the skim coat of it. Um, at this point in time, now's probably a good opportunity for you to reach out to the home buyer and say, hey guys, do you want to have a home inspection? Do you wanna pay for a home inspection? Even though the property has a series of, you know, a series of, um, inspections that are done by the municipality, people are only human. I mean, things do get uh, messed up, things, mistakes are made. Um, and I think that, you know, to me, 
every home buyer um, should probably do an inspection. Um, I'd say that more and more you're seeing home buyers um, requesting an inspection um, because again, I mean, people are only human um, and, and mistakes and things get missed. Um, so that's an opportunity for you to reach out to the home buyer and say, hey guys, do you think it's worth your while to do a home inspection? Then from there, um, the ceilings get textured and there are some different texture styles that are available. It's very rare that you will find a builder, uh, a production builder anyways, that will offer a smooth ceiling. And the reason being is because it, they have a difficult time doing a smooth ceiling and hiding um, drywall creases. So once the house has been drywalled, there's two coats of paint that go on the house. The first coat is called a primer paint. And then the second coat is the final coat of paint. Some builders will only offer white. Other builders will offer three or four different colors, but they pick one color for the whole house. You only get one choice for the whole house. You can't put a blue room here or a pink room here or a gray room here. It's just one color for the whole house. And they're typically always a flat paint and they're generally not scrubbable. Um, and they do this because it hides the seams better and it hides like just marks better for the builder. Okay, so after the house has been painted, then it starts the interior trim process. And that means that the baseboard goes in, the interior doors, the railing, the crown molding, all get installed um, by the, the, the trim carpenters. And then from there, then they will start to install the cabinets. The cabinets in the kitchen go in, the cabinets in the bathroom go in, um, and then um, the flooring goes in next. Um, hard surface flooring typically goes in first, and then the carpet and the carpet pad goes in second. And then from there, they typically will cover everything up um, and um, the house generally will start getting locked up at that point. Um, prior to that, usually the house is unlocked, um, but once they start to get the, you know, the, the finished materials in there, they will start locking the house up after working hours. And generally what I mean by that is on the weekends it's locked up and then anytime after three o'clock in the afternoon, the house is locked up so that the, you know, if, if the, the home buyer wants to get into the house, they have to reach out to the sales rep or the construction supervisor to gain access to it. And it's not necessarily to, to keep the home buyers from getting into the house. It's, it's there to keep everybody else from, from getting into the house. But there's nothing worse than, you know, a home buyer walking into their house and somebody came in and tracked all over their flooring before they had an opportunity for the floors to get covered up and they're all muddy and dirty. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't go well. So after that, um, then the countertops go in, kitchen countertops, bathroom countertops will then get installed and then they'll start the finished mechanicals. Um, now with the finished mechanicals, they also have inspections that are done. So the outlets, covers, the switch covers, the can lights, and then the lighting package will be installed at the house. <laughs> then from there, the finished plumbing goes in. So um, like the toilets and the sinks and, and the tubs, lots of guys get you know, installed, exterior faucets, the hot water tank get installed. That, that's all the finished plumbing work that gets installed. Then from there, they do the finished HVAC. They're, they're gonna connect the furnace to the ductwork. They're gonna install the air conditioning unit. Um, and then make sure that they're properly working. And again, that all inspections go with that. Once the house is now, it, so at this point, for the most part, the house is pretty much finished. Um, then from there, they're gonna do a professional cleaning on the house, which is really construction clean, but it's a professional cleaning. And um, from there, the house is pretty much ready to go um, for closing. Um, the last but not least, the appliances get installed. Um, and the reason that they get installed at the very end, and even sometimes after the, um, the new, or ho new home orientation, they get installed, and they're mainly so that they don't get stolen out of the property. Okay, so on the outside of the house, I just wanted to point out um, grading. So on the inside of the house, we talked about the inside of the house, but we really didn't talk about the outside of the house. So um, the grading process needs to be done. Then they, you know, they install the gutters and the downspouts. They install the landscaping package, and then they install the sod. Um, but I want to make you aware that winter houses require escrows. So generally from December through March, uh, if a home buyer closes during that time frame, they are not going to get, maybe sometimes exterior paint is not completed. 
Um, they may not have a driveway. They'll only have a temporary driveway, which is going to be a gravel driveway. They will not have a final grade on the property. They won't have any landscaping on the property. And what I mean by escrow is that certain times of year, once the weather permits, houses that are scheduled to close in typically April on will take priority over escrow houses. So the houses that are closing in April, the lenders require them to have non-escrow items installed because the weather is conducive to it. And then the other houses don't. The other houses they're gonna play catch up on. And if there's a shortage of sod, or if we get lots of rain during the summer, the home buyer that closed on their house in the winter time may not get it all summer long. Okay. So one of the things I suggest doing as a realtor is prior to the new home orientation, schedule a walkthrough a couple of days ahead of time and just go over a checklist. This is an example of a checklist that I use or I recommend using um, so that you, know, you, you have a thorough understanding um, of, of things that still need attention, of things that have been installed, of things that are missing, so that when you do the new home orientation, you're kind of ahead of the game. The new home orientation is the final walkthrough for the house. It's not really a time to nitpick the house. It's really more of a time to review everything inside of the house, everything outside of the house, anything that still needs attention, but it's also made so that the buyers learn how to take care of their home. The, the, like the, you have to, you know, what, what are my to-do things? draining the hot water tank, changing your furnace filter, how to operate your thermostat. Um, you know, you have to seal your grout in your bathrooms or seal your grout um, or, or seal the, um, the granite countertops. So it's really like, how do I take care of my home? How do I maintain my home? And at the same time, then the builder typically at that time will give them either a, you know, a, a, a CD or all of the warranty packet that's affiliated with the house. Um, in a package that they can go home with. And it's important that you advise your home buyer to definitely go through that packet because there are things that they register for. One of the big advantages of buying a new home is everything's brand spanking new and everything comes with a warranty. But if you haven't registered for some of these things, you know, you may not know if your hot water tank was on recall, you could have gotten a brand new hot water tank three years down the road and you didn't know because you didn't register. So once everything's done and the final walkthrough has been do, typically completed uh, and they've repaired everything, closing day happens. And that usually happens anywhere from two to seven days prior after the final walkthrough. Um, the buyer gets the keys to the house. You close typically um, at the, the builder's you know, title company and they can take occupancy immediately. After closing, there are two inspections that are done. One is a 30-day post-closing inspection, and the other one is a one-year drywall inspection. Um, the 30-day post-closing inspection is typically, it works like this. Um, after a homeowner moves into the house, you never really know if minor adjustments need to be taken care of, but once you've moved in and you start living there, you might see things that need minor adjustments, like a window doesn't open and close the way it should, a, a door you know, squeaks, or um, a cabinet doesn't work as well as it should. Um, those are the things that they're talking about. And what I recommend for home buyers is, you know, once you've moved in, take a notepad, put it in a drawer, and as you see things, you know, write it down. Because what the construction supervisors, once he calls you, he's going to say, hey, do you have a list for me? They're expecting you to have a list. They know that there's things that are going to be missed that 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 need attention, and they're expecting that. What they don't want to have happen is that you don't have a list and you're not prepared, and then you know three weeks after you had this inspection, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell them about this particular item. Um, and at that point, basically, they're going to say it's too late. Um, they would rather have you wait for the one year inspection. So the one year inspection is basically a drywall inspection. Um, they do drywall repair, but they do not repaint. Um, and then from there, most builders have a two year warranty on mechanicals and then every builder um, varies on what their extended structural warranty is. Rule of thumb is typically about 10 years now. Some have more, some have left, have, have less. Um, every builder wants to have happy customers and they typically will have a survey system affiliated with it as well. Um, and the sales reps 
commissions or bonuses are lots of times tied, just like supervisors, just like everybody is tied to this, you know, giving, um, uh, you, know, you know, excellent scores. Um, so that's, that's important as well. Um, if you had a good experience, they want tens. If you didn't have a good experience, they want to hear about it so they can improve. I think that's pretty much it, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Anybody? I don't think I do, but um, it was a great presentation. Was it helpful, I think? I don't know. <laughs> I think so. I think it was very informative. So, um, Alex, do you have anything to touch on? I feel like you did a really amazing job, you know, walking okay. people through what exactly that looks like and what the build process looks like. Um, the only thing I can possibly highlight is that you also really gave reason to show with what what happens after the fact and what some of the things that we overlook in an inspection um, on a already existing home that may be just as relevant or even more relevant on a new build. Um, as we talk about settling, as we talk about those escrows during the winter months, as we talk about whatever might happen during that building process, Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, um, you really showed the value that as an agent you bring to your buyer. Oh, good. I mean, you know, I think the, the biggest thing that I have found is realtors struggling with how do I show that I am a value? Um, and during the build process, you know, it's like how to stay involved in the build process. If, if, you know, I mean, let's face it, there's hardly any houses to, to, to show people anymore. And people after, you know, they've lost out on, you know, four or five contracts because they got outbid. You should always suggest, hey, you, you want to look at building a house? I mean, it's, it's not it's not a lot of fun, but it can be a lot of fun, depending on how you look at it. Um, but once you're in contract with the builder, the realtor kind of feels left out. And, and the way that just to stay involved is you almost have to say, okay, once every couple of weeks, touch base with the, with the sales rep, touch base with your buyer. Actually, I have my sales reps trained so well that every single email, every single communication that goes out to that buyer, I get a copy of. So that I'm kept in the loop the entire time. And that's why it's important to have a go-to person with each one of these companies. Because once you, if you demand it, they'll give it to you because they feel if, if they give you good service, you're going to bring them more business. So anybody else? Okay. Well, I mean, if um, you, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I have a quick question. Yeah. And maybe this isn't, maybe we can talk offline about this too. Um, have you heard uh, or seen in the office the APHW new construction warranties that basically pick up where the builder leaves off? Um, I am not familiar with those warranties. No, I am not. Okay. I'm, I, I'm not familiar with them at all. I mean, my rule, my feeling is for the first, if, if somebody buys a house and builds new for the first five years, there really shouldn't be anything. You know, if there's a disadvantage to a home buyer of buying a new home, here's, here's the disadvantages. You can't purchase a fence in the contract. Typically, outdoor living areas are never in the contract and they're, they're gonna have to buy those extra on their own. Um, window treatments are typically not part of the contract. You can buy them with the builders, but lots of times they, people wanna buy them on their own. Um, and then there's typically no landscaping in the backyard at all. It's just it's just sod. And those are additional expenses that the home buyer has to incur. Um, as far as mechanicals go, I think it's pretty common to have two years on all the mechanicals with the house. And then from there, you know, the structural warranty. But a lot of people don't understand what the structural warranty is. The structural warranty is basically against the foundation caving in or cracking or issues like that. It's not, you know, major. And lots of times they're third party warranties. So, um, you know, they're not, so, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. I think I've heard of those, but I've never utilized any of those. Okay, cool. Well, um, maybe Alex and I can talk to you later about that sometime. Okay. Cool. 
but good to go and thanks for everything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you want any more information about new, new construction, ask me. I mean, a lot of people don't, I hope I was helpful on some of the terms like what is a plot plan? What is a plat? What are some of these terms that these builders are using? Because the last thing I think that a lot of realtors, they don't, they're don't they not familiar with it and they don't want to feel stupid to their, their home buyer either, you know? Um, and you know, call me anytime. I can explain everything to you. Thank you. And actually you, you brought up something that I think will be helpful um, for my own home that it's not a new build, but uh, I didn't realize I'd have to drain my hot water heater. Yes, you're supposed to drain it once a year. So now I know. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> Um, because they're because they're lazy. So yeah, yeah. you're supposed to your hot water tank once a year. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So anything else, guys? If I can add one other thing. Yeah. I love that you brought up what they do with the lending and the credit repair. And I also would like to caution and say that because the new build process does take significantly longer than a traditional purchase. The other side can add. Yes. There's, the, there's the other half of that, which yes. is people make mistakes. People are fully eligible. They're doing everything right. And this is where as an agent, it is even that much more relevant that you stay fully in touch with your consumer through that entire year, every week, every two weeks of, okay, you didn't buy a car. Okay. You didn't quit your job. Okay. You didn't buy furniture. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like oh, yeah. you are doing nothing. Your life is on hold. I know you're nine months pregnant. Your life is on hold until after we close. Too bad, so sad. <laughs> that, the, that is the truth. Uh, Cause I've had deals blow up because people go out and buy something and it's like, wait a second. And they even, the lender tells them, they say, don't buy anything, don't do anything. If you are thinking about it, call us first and we'll let you know what we can do. And they don't listen and, and deals fall apart. And then they wonder why they can't buy the house. Well, you caused it. So no, I get it. So yep, yeah, that's that's a very good point. You're right. So all right, guys, if you think of anything else, let me know. I'm always here for you. Bye now. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>